Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is uh, Joy Duraraj, and I'm a security product manager for uh, um, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I've been with Hewlett Packard for more than three years, with OpenStack for almost two years now. But I've been in security for many years, and I joined uh, uh, Hewlett Packard from Symantec. Um, so I've been doing product management and, and uh, development for many years in, in the field of security. Um, how's everyone doing today? Great, great, great. <laughs> so raise your hand if um, your organization is bound by um, you know, any type of compliance. Like raise your hand if you're bound by PCI or FedRAMP or, okay, great, HIPAA. Is it um, FedRAMP, HIPAA, or um, you know, what type of compliance? HIPAA, excellent, great. Um, so anyway, so um, what I'll be talking today, and uh, thank you again for joining me, you know, the next, um, uh, or the next, you know, 35 to 40 minutes, um, what I'd like to uh, walk, uh, you know, make sure that you all walk away from this, uh, uh, this discussion from the session is knowing, you know, what is compliance, why it matters. Uh, perhaps a lot of you might, some of you might be already knowing this, but I just want to make sure that we have a common ground before we start. And then what are the changes, what are the challenges with cloud security compliance? I mean, people have talked about compliance all the time. It's a big checkbox. So really, what is it that about cloud security, particularly, you know, something like OpenStack that actually makes it more challenging? And then we want to talk about you know, the types of compliance. And when I talk, talk to customers a lot, there's always some sort of confusion about you know, product compliance versus service delivery base. So they ask questions like, hey, is Op Helium OpenStack you know, PCI compliant? And then I stop them at their tracks and say, no, no, no. P uh, Helium OpenStack is a you know, software distribution when it goes out to customers. So that means you know, some of the controls that physical administrative are still fall under, falling under customer responsibility. So I kind of want to set the stage on you know, what are the different types of compliance. And then I want to walk you through an example of PCI DSS 3.1. And I want to give you an example of the different sections and how um, you know, OpenStack, or particularly uh, HP Helium OpenStack, can be configured to meet those uh, requirements. And PCI DSS is a huge discussion in and of itself, so I probably won't do too much you know, um, justification given the short amount of time, but I do want to highlight the different areas and see, hey, what are some of the uh, key OpenStack features that help you know, fulfill this uh, requirement? So without further ado, um, it's you know, no secret that uh, security continues to be the single biggest barrier to adoption. And um, this is so because there's a lot of it is probably lack of knowledge and people don't have this visibility and control over where their data is being stored, you know, who's handling the data and uh, what kind of controls are in place, that visibility, lack of visibility, lack of monitoring, a lot of these puts you know, um, suspicion and fear in the, in the, in the minds of C-level uh, um, execs and other organizations that are trying to make the, the uh, uh, the journey to the uh, to cloud. And then the, when, when we take a look at um, you know, compliance, but really in reality, compliance is more of a checkbox. Just being compliant doesn't mean that you know, organizations can feel very secure. What is more important is they have to have a risk mitigation strategy in place to stay ahead of threats. The biggest fear from, for a lot of organizations is not, is not really, you know, um, the compliance is a headache. Yes, you can you know, somehow uh, meet these, but the bigger fear is, hey, wh what do I do with perceived threats, right? Well, what happens if there's an attacker sitting in my network and I, I don't even know that he's, he or she is there for days together, and then something happens, by that time it's too late to respond. So that type of you know, being able to be staying ahead of threats, being more proactive is really, very critical. So 
that's why, I mean, the common example is, you know, we've got um, Home Depot, Target. I'm pretty sure they're all, you know, PCA compliant. But just because they were PCA compliant, that didn't mean that, you know, they could not get hacked. So it's very important to understand that, you know, uh, compliance is an important as milestone, but you have to go beyond that to have a proper risk mitigation strategy in place. So when we look at, take a look at cloud security, so particularly let's say OpenStack, so what is it about cloud security that makes this compliance more and even security concerns more difficult? So first of all, you know, we are all, these are all um, you know, software defined um, um, architecture. You've got REST APIs, you've got DevOps, you've got continuous integration, CI, CD. So then the, the important thing here is in an open source software, how um, it's, it's important to understand if your vendor is using secure coding practices. Are they doing things like, are they doing source code analysis? Are they doing, you know, um, are they following threat architectures? So it's very important so when you, you know, make a decision to uh, go with a vendor, whether it's HP or any of our other vendors in this space, it's important for you to understand that, you know, uh, secure coding practices, you need to make sure that they're hardening uh, your, uh, the distro with every release. And then when we talk about rapid uh, scales, uh, rapid provisioning and scalability, so that's a huge, you know, cloud benefit. But then the, the reality is how do you monitor for drifts and how do you ensure continuous compliance? That continuous compliance is a huge challenge for a lot of organizations. And the reason for that is, you know, when you're in a cloud environment, you've got P, you've got your users bursting clouds left, right, and center. You've got your guest operating systems sitting there. You've not rebooted your servers in many months. How do you ensure that they are patched properly? So that is important. And how do you ensure that your guest operating systems are up to date from a compliance standpoint? How do you monitor for any kind of drifts? I mean, how do you make sure that, you know, when uh, from a coding, even from a coding practice perspective, that um, uh, developers are not doing things like, you know, so, um, security bad, bad practices like storing passwords in clear text or storing passwords in configuration files. So these are all a lot of security best practices that needs to be followed and needs to be, you know, taken into consideration when you do, when you think about compliance. So they, we talked about virtualization. Uh, virtualization is a huge benefit. So we talked about, you know, how do you monitor your east-west traffic? So the recent survey has shown that, you know, majority of the threats are actually coming from insiders. More customers are more, I mean, organizations are more worried about insider threats than anything else. So in that case, then, how do you secure your data center traffic? And that's an important aspect from a security standpoint. How do you isolate? How do you isolate your environments? How do you patch them? How do you harden them? And then now the, the other um, the benefit of uh, cloud is that it brings about multi-tenancy. So when you think about multi-tenancy, now you've all got, you know, how do you achieve proper rollback, uh, roll, roll, or back, role-based access control? How do you audit all user activity, particularly admin activity? And so this is a huge pain point for a lot of customers that we talk to. They're very worried about, hey, I don't know, you know, privileged access, you talk about stack user, privileged access, hey, I want to know who are these users that are actually going to be, you know, installing my, uh, bootstrapping my environment and installing it. So it's very important to understand that you've got to have auditing all the way through. I mean, not just the OpenStack services, but also your physical layer, your, uh, your hypervisor, your host operating system. And of course, application workloads, um, you know, typically customers have that type of um, auditing already there. I mean, it's kind of out of scope from a, you know, infrastructure as a service perspective, but from a compliance standpoint, very important to understand, you know, what the different layers are. Then we talk about compliance due diligence. Now, this is an important aspect. So this is where we talk about, you know, um, I brought up this example of, you know, um, customers and some of, you know, some of some of the people who are still trying to get their head around OpenStack. The first question they ask is, oh, AWS is, you know, PCI, FedRAMP, and all of this compliant. What about OpenStack? Then the 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 response to that is. You know, OpenStack is a software distribution. Ultimately, you know, when a customer deploys it in their environment or they engage a service provider to do it on their behalf, they need to understand what the different responsibilities are. And then we'll talk about it in just a second. So then the concept of shared responsibility comes into picture. 
there are things that you know the vendor is responsible for. They need to make sure you've got the right feature set to um, to comply with uh, standards. And then there are you know um, I would say service provider responsibilities. So if they are managing their data center, how do they do the physical um, you know aspect, the physical controls, like biometrics and security guards and and cameras, closed circuit cameras, etc. And then you've got customer, like for example, you, like you as a customer, ultimately responsible for getting the certification. So it's very important to understand these concepts. Um, and then of course, this is just saying, you know, what is compliance? Of course, compliance is, you know, set of regulations, standards and laws. And then the assessment and audit is very important. And, law, and many of you probably are, you know, your security team or you yourself are engaging with external auditors to go through your compliance. And the assessment needs to be done first. So you have to make sure, you know, what are the different systems and, you know, how, how many of these are in scope, how many are out of scope. And that assessment is important before you perform an audit. Probably, I'm sure, you know, many of you have already gone through this process before. And then, the, the third aspect is certification. So once you go through the audit, then the auditor comes back and says, yes, checkbox, you know, all these uh, rules have been satisfied, and great, here is a certificate that says that you're PCI compliant or HIPAA compliant or whatever. But then the important aspect to this is a lot of these is not a one-time activity, it's an ongoing activity because you got to be, you know, doing, doing annual audits or perhaps, you know, you do quarterly scans, depending on, you know, what level of compliance you and risk mitigation you want to take. Um, why compliance is important? Of course, these are barrier to entry. You've got uh, fines that are levied. Uh, you've got penalties. In some cases, you've got even jail time. A uh, classic example would be, you know, there were some companies which, um, uh, which inadvertently uh, sent out um, personally identifiable data. They ended up paying a huge fine. Um, and then there are different, you know, um, this is probably something that most of you are already familiar with, but I wanted to put a, um, you know, common ground here saying there are various different, uh, depending on what type of industry you fall under, uh, there are different types of certifications um, and the evaluators are all different. And then the regulation standards are all could be very different. Could be things like, you know, financial and legal services. You could go under SOC, uh, SOC compliance or PCI. Healthcare, life sciences, HIPAA. If you're a cloud service provider, uh, you would want to, you know, uh, CSA star is a commonly known standard that uh, cloud service providers go through. If you're technology, media, telecom, ISO is another great example. Um, so these are all just examples of how this thing works. Um, I'm so sorry, I just don't seem to be getting this right. Um, and then we, we already covered this in terms of service delivery based versus product. And as I said, you know, when you take about public cloud providers, they're all service delivery based. And then so they all always, you know, will go through the full audit um, compliance. Uh, whereas product, if you take a product or a distribution, they, they uh, you know, we can do certifications like common criteria, FIPS 140, et cetera. And the reason for that is every compliance standard has three types of controls. You've got administrative controls, which are typically very, you know, awareness, training, documentation, disaster recovery plans, and your um, risk mitigation strategy, your data classification. How do you classify the data, right? I mean, not everything needs to be super secret. I mean, the different levels of classification. Based on that, you know, that, that dictates the amount of spending you would do to become certified. And then there are technical uh, features. So this is the important aspect of where, which I will be covering, which is really saying, what are the product features that help customers become compliant? And then there are physical controls that we talk, talked, I alluded earlier, which is you know, all the things that you would do in a physical um, environment, like closed circuits, TV, security guards, biometrics. Now, um, and um, maybe some of you have already gone through this process, so it's not you know, surprising, but for those of us who are new to this, you know, we would be surprised that, hey, even you have to literally like walk your auditors through how secure an environment is, literally go through all these different you know, 
uh, physical controls, your uh, administrative controls, and of course technical controls is something that um, you know we people like me. I'm a product manager. I understand it very easily because to me it's like, oh great, I've got this product feature. You know, you've got this reporting that you can show. You can take a screenshot. You can do all kinds of you know things to prove, demonstrate to your auditors that you're compliant. But all these other aspects are also important from a compliance standpoint. In summary, um, when we talk about you know, cloud, cloud compliance uh, concerns, we think about you know, the, the environment is constantly changing, how do you automate compliance? This automation is also an important, is, uh, is a key concern for many customers. And the reason for this is gets to be a very huge pain point because literally I've heard from customers, they're saying that, you know, I have to literally take log files and take, you know, sift through the log files and show it to my auditors. It's very painful. If I had, you know, ready, ready-made reporting um, that would help me, you know, with a ready, with a good formatting, I could show it to my auditors. And then in some cases, they say I literally have to call my auditor, right, sit right next to me, show them on the screen that, hey, this is how we are, uh, you know, satisfying these controls. So when when we look at it, we say, hey, how do you help? help customers automate that process. And I think that's an important aspect of it. Compliant, checking for compliance drifts is important in a cloud environment because you've got VM sprawls all the time. You've got you know, your users coming in and out. You're you know, cloud bursting. How do you keep them patched? How do, you keep, how do you keep them isolated? Very important. And also, how do you measure integrity against a known good state? So this is again looking at you know, hardware-based route of trust. And we are having a panel discussion later this afternoon with Intel and Visa. So I'm going to be part of that. So we're going to show you how you know, HP, um, the uh, hardware, has these uh, modules, uh, TXT, TPM modules, which when you integrate with, say, um, Intel, you know, cloud integration technology or open attestation server, how do you get that uh, root of trust and how do you use that root of trust to enforce security policies? So that is um, an interesting and an important one, especially in data sovereignty um, compliance standards because customers are asking like, hey, how do, you, how do I make sure that only users who have you know, um, only users who are located out of France, for example, can run workloads on my service. And I have a global, you know, large enterprise. I've got globally distributed users. Uh, the other pain point is how do I control the workload um, access? I only want users to be running workloads on servers which are trusted. So these type of policies can or also play a big role from a compliance standpoint. So, and in summary, you also have to start off with an enterprise cloud strategy. You need to understand, you know, what cloud services you'll be using, who is responsible for what. That separation of duties is critical. You have to be able to map out and say, hey, these are my users that are going to be using OpenStack, or these are my dedicated users that are going to be installing OpenStack. So that way you have good visibility and control over who is, you know, audit or who is doing what. And then the... Um, the, and the other part is also how much risk are you willing to accept? So it also depends on your risk uh, you know, mitigation strategy and you know, based on your workloads. If they're dev test workloads, you, know, you don't care. Not, not, you don't need to go into heavy duty security. But then you think about you know, production workloads, yes. There's some definitely a you know, good amount of security. Compliant workloads, great amount of security. So it's kind of like your Goldilocks story, you know, what is the right fit like this is too big, too small, but this is the right thing that uh, that feels good. So, what is right? No, there's no one size fits all. Um, what is right for one organization is obviously, you know, is different from different organizations. So, I want to take um, the next, you know, 15 uh, minutes talking about um, uh, um, PCI DSS. Uh, most of you are already familiar with PCI DSS. I won't go into too much detail about it. And uh, so we recently did, um, um, you know, PCI DSS uh, assessment. We did external assessment using an auditor, and uh, we are going. We, you know, HP Helium OpenStack 3.0 onwards is PCI ready, and um, we'll have literature uh, coming up shortly. 
and um, we'll show you different controls, how we need different controls. And what is important to understand here is, you know, um, the, um, the, the uh, classification of different uh, sections. So in PCI DSS is basically, a, a, in summary, applies to cardholder data. So anybody that's storing, transmitting, or handling credit card data, there's different levels of PCI compliance. There's a huge website and standards body devoted to this completely. Um, so more information can be found there. Then there is the different levels, level one, level two, level three, all based on the number of transactions you, um, um, you, know, you handle and whether you're a merchant like Visa or American Express or someone else, or whether you're a, um, or a, whether you're a provider. Say for example, you could be on a retail provider that's handling credit card, um, or you could even be any enterprise that's using credit card for handling your um, transactions. So in, it's important to understand the difference between you know, certification and compliance. Um, so even in the world of PCI, there's a self-certification, and then there is the proper, you know, going through the proper audit and engaging an auditor and getting certified. Now the latter is, takes more, obviously takes more time and more, ex, um, obviously, you know, uh, more expensive. Uh, but the self-certification is more of a saying, oh yeah, great, you know, I'm PCI compliant. But in certain cases, you know, it may, takes, it, uh, it, the certification is obviously more, um, carries more value and um, carries, um, is more, you know, a lot of weight. And then um, what is important, we talked about this earlier, is understanding the scope. And the scope is critical because you need to understand how many servers are you know, actually storing or they're handling or transmitting. In some scenarios, you may not be storing any credit card, you'll just be handling or transmitting. So you need to understand the difference. You need to get an inventory of all the different systems that touch PCI, that, or rather that touch the credit uh, cardholder data. And then there are you know, things like tokenization, uh, which can be used to uh, reduce scope. Um, you may have probably been following uh, Voltage, uh, which was bought out by uh, HP Enterprise um, almost a year ago. So now they're part of our data security um, um, business unit. So they have great solution. They have um, format preserving encryption um, and um, uh, tokenization, um, stateless tokenization technologies. They have very proven products. They've been in the market for many years. They're the market leaders. So if you're interested in those, I would absolutely encourage you. And um, uh, you know, I know this is a bit of a marketing pitch, but this is our session, so I have full, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm fully okay to talk about it. So. so you should absolutely check it out if you're interested in that type of uh, solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give highlights of different sections and then say, um, you know, what is, uh, how we're going to be meeting uh, these type of requirements. So sections one and two, they talk about building and maintaining a secure network and systems. So when we talk, when we look at this particular section, there are controls which are administrative controls, and then there are controls which are physical controls. So those are completely, you know, outside the scope of any product-based um, control. So if you look at the features of OpenStack, which will help you address this. So we've got network segmentation, um, you've got you know, um, neutron-based capabilities, you've got IP groups, security groups, IP tables, um, all your um, you know, quotas for managing your resources. So all the networking features, security features, absolutely help meet these particular section of requirements. And then this talks mainly about making sure you've got firewalls in place, making sure you've got you know, the network security aspect um, uh, in place. So that's, an, uh, that's, an, that's one of the key features that will help uh, meet this requirement. So when we take a look at uh, sections three and four, so, so there are 12 sections in total, and then there is an appendix that talks about uh, shared, um, uh, that talks about service provider requirements. So sections three and four talks about protecting the cardholder data. So the moment we think about protection, we are always thinking, hey, you know, data address protection and uh, transmission of data, and, uh, you know, encrypting data in transit. So. Very straightforward, basically there are 26 total controls of which seven are administrative, procedural, 19 are fall under customer responsibility. 
So the key features that of OpenStack or even, you know, let's say even HP Helium OpenStack that help uh, meet this requirement is we've got encryption of stored uh, cardholder data. So typically in majority of the cases, you know, customers already have their own PCI compliant workloads. More than, you know, most often they're not, they're not, probably not using uh, you know, OpenStack, Cinder, or whatever it is for storing that data. They're probably having, you know, their own, say, um, storage systems. But if they choose to, you know, use OpenStack, we've got data address encryption, Cinder block storage, you've got the Barbicon, you've got the key management using Barbicon. Um, you've also got the ability for Barbicon to talk to an external key management device. And I would say that Barbicon is probably, you know, still evolving. Um, it's still, you know, they're still trying to get some key management um, uh, capabilities in place. But in reality, there are other choices that are more, um, you know, more interesting. More interesting choices like using an external uh, key management device. An example would be uh, HPE ESKM, which is our enterprise security key manager. Uh, it used to be called Atala key manager, but now it's called um, ESKM. Now that particular, it's a hardware-based appliance, very expensive, but it, it is completely, you know, tamper evident. You've got um, HA uh, built in. You've got high availability built in. You've got um, FIPS compliance. It's all been completely, you know, certified for FIPS. It's PCI compliant. So those uh, uh, key management devices really help, you know, meet this particular requirement when you talk about encryption of um, data. And then there is also I talk I talked about data centric encryption and tokenization from HPE data security, the voltage solution, and then the encryption of data on transit. So this is pretty straightforward. I mean, you know, most vendors, including us, we've got um, TLS to access to external data API endpoints. We've got TLS, and pretty soon, you know, we we also are working. We have um, we are encrypting some amount of traffic um, in the, within the internal you know, to, but between in the internal cloud traffic between API to API, uh, between say RabbitMQ to um, you know other APIs and so on. So, but it's important that you know these two are the key requirements when you take a look at um, um, sections three and four. So five and six talk about maintaining a vulnerability management program. Um, so if you take, uh, this has about 24 of them are administrative procedural. And so this is, uh, talks about malware maintaining proper patching. So this brings us back to, you know, patch management. And patch management is very, it's very painful, but it's a necessary thing to uh, meet this particular uh, section. And, and again, when you look at OpenStack, and when you talk to different vendors, or, or even when you talk to us, the way that we approach this is we, we, um, we deliver a single set of you know, uh, patches, and then we have this critical security patches. We've got turnaround time for delivering critical security patches. And those patches not only include uh, OpenStack, but the entire distribution, so our host operating system, which is the um, HPE Linux. And um, so what we do is we make sure that, you know, um, a normal uh, releases contain all the bug fixes and everything, which is typical of any vendor. I mean, you, you talk to anybody, they'll say the same thing. And we are no different either. So, um, so, but what is important is for you to understand, you know, what is the critical security fixes and need to understand what the process is, how often do your vendors, you know, give you those patches, what is the turnaround time, where do you go get the advisories, all of that is critical. And then the, the, uh, the other uh, customer best practice is you have to deploy um, antivirus, anti-malware. And um, there are a few things that are available for, uh, you know, a, um, you know um, I would say in a virtualized environment, but um, still this is, I think, I haven't really found anything that's um, more open source, but there are a lot of choices available uh, for customers. So seven, eight, and nine talk about implementing strong access control procedures. Um, so this is again restricting access, control, access to cardholder data, uh, identifying and authenticating. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. You've got the Keystone um, authentication service, which has, 
you know, which meets all these different uh, features. You've got all the built-in capabilities, uh, directory-based authentication, role-based access control. Um, so all of that covers the OpenStack layer. Now, when you really look at it, you know, additionally, what we do is we do we do security during bootstrapping. So that's important. So when you when you talk to when you buy, uh, hopefully, you know, you you all go with HP Helium OpenStack. But when you look at other vendors, then you have to be able to evaluate what their security is during bootstrapping. This is before the, all the OpenStack services are even installed. How do you access different keys? What are the config file settings? What are the service passwords? How are they doing the encryption of data in REST and transit? Um, how are they, are they following security best practices like segmented networks, you know, separate networks for uh, your uh, uh, storage traffic versus say your, um, you know, your um, um, management plane, your data plane. Um, so you got to make sure that they're following all these you know, security best practices. And then the SSH key, so this is very important. So when you bootstrap OpenStack or any distribution, you've got the stack stack user. How do you, you know, access all the controller and uh, compute nodes? You've got SSH keys. How, how is your vendor protecting those SSH, SSH keys? Are they using a passphrase to encrypt it? Where is the passphrase being stored? You know, how can, you got to think about in attack scenarios, right? Can an attacker, if they gain access to it, can they gain access to that encryption keys and what's the damage being done? So very important to pay attention to that bootstrapping security beyond just the OpenStack security. So 10 and 11 talk about regularly monitoring and testing networks. Um, so you've got, um, you know, uh, the logging is important. So how are we meeting it? We've got audit logs, which are CADF compliant. Uh, CADF stands for Cloud Audit Data Federation. And it's, a, it's an interesting one from, an, from a compliance standpoint, but because it meets a lot of the seven Ws that you need from an auditing perspective. Um, so you've got to be able to back up your audit logs uh, frequently. Uh, regularly in a, in, a, you know, in a proper cadence. You've got centralized logging um, that will help uh, achieve this. And again, additional best practices, you've got to do things like file integrity monitoring, penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, wireless IDS, IPS. So these are all things that are not, out, these are all outside of OpenStack, but these are all things that customers have to think about when they, uh, when they uh, want to meet DSS, PCI DSS requirements. So 12, 12 talks about maintaining a policy. This is, um, uh, this is again, um, you know, there's only one OpenStack control, which is automatically disconnecting idle sessions. And so this is met by Keystone TTL tokens. Um, and um, the rest of it is all procedural. Um, now, um, Appendix A talks about shared uh, hosting providers requirement. So this is in a multi-tenant model. You got to make sure that it's fully segmented from each other, if necessary. And how do you achieve tenant isolation, right? So you have um, you want to keep them in a separate pro project based, um, and the audit logs have to be segmented by tenants, um, so that in a service provider model, you can you know each customer can access their own uh, data. Um, and then you also have things like you know neutron-based, role-based access for networks, so you can. Um, you know, basically prevent each other from seeing each other in each other's uh, networks. Um, so in, um, in summary, we talked about a lot of things. You have to have the right mitigation strategy, visibility control. You've got to harden, you've got to isolate. So we do a lot of things from a hardening perspective. So we do, we do app armor for uh, compute nodes. Um, uh, uh, controller nodes, and also, you know, uh, uh, we are introducing um, Red Hat KVM for a compute node, so we, you, we will be introducing SC Linux as well. So then, uh, you know, with every release of Helium OpenStack, it's, we follow the security best practices, we do threat reviews, we do penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, all critical threats are immediated prior to, um, you know, giving a, releasing it to customers. Um, then, so this isolation hardening, very key. You got to have proper auditing um, and then um, proper patching. So I kind of want to, you know, uh, wrap up with this. So again, keep in mind the key takeaway is compliance, compliance alone is not enough. You have to have a risk mitigation strategy, which is equally important. Um, oh, um, I want to throw it open to questions and answers. Any questions from the audience? 
Sure. Sure. So first of all, you need to understand, you know, who your public cloud provider is, and uh, typically the you know common ones are AWS, Azure, and so on. You need to find out if uh, they are already PCI compliant, because it's important in order for you to achieve that PCI compliance, your service provider must have be, must already be you know PCI compliant, and they will give you a package. They will say, hey, here is a report from an external auditor that goes through all these different controls, and um, AWS actually does that, but you have to be a customer to get that report. And uh, Azure has a report that's available publicly on their website. Uh, but you, once you get that report, you have to go through those different controls, and then it'll tell you, you know, uh, these are all customer responsibility. So then when they go through each of these, and then when you look at the ones that you are responsible for, then what you need to do is you need to take that report, you need to work with your own auditor. You need to work with an external audit firm. There are so many available today. Um, you know, if you go to the PCI DSS website, you will see a list of all the approved um, auditors. You can engage with any of them and then say, hey, uh, this, is, this is the report I got from my provider, and how do I go about doing this? And then they will say, okay, you know, you got to so provide documentation that you're supporting all these uh, data, data. So that's the process you would take. You talked about um, encrypting config files, and uh, are you encrypting the whole file or just the passwords in them? Or? The passwords in the file. And, and where are you storing the encryption key that's used to uh, encrypt this? So encryption keys can be stored in different places. So yes. you can configure them to say, you know, store, depending on where they are, it could be yeah, Ansible Vault, or you could uh, store them in Ansible Vault, and, and you know, down the road you can look at ways of integrating with outside key, external key providers, and configuring it to store it externally. But today, the um, uh, the Cinder encryption keys and then the Nova ephemeral encryption keys, they're all, you can take them from Barbican, and you can configure Barbican to say, hey, store these keys in an ESKM device or a KMIP compliant device. Mm -hmm. so. and is the purpose of that to keep uh, someone with root access to the box from being able to? Yeah, the, the biggest, um, you know, the, the biggest reason why you want to do that is you want to keep your encryption keys separate from the data. You don't want to commingle them. And the reason for that is, let's say, in the event of an attack in your OpenStack cloud, um, you know, the attacker will not be able to gain access to your keys because they're stored in a totally, you know, it, different that's, appliance. That's not really what I mean. Mm. What's the point of encrypting the passwords to, in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, because the, the, the um, config files themselves are only accessible to, let's say it's a Nova config file, it's only going to be accessible to Nova mm -hmm. and to root. Mm -hmm. um, Unless you found a way to keep root from being able to get access to that key somehow, but with, through whatever you're doing, uh, Nova's going to have to be able to access the key in order to decrypt it, in order to use it in the service anyway. And so, have you have you really added mm -hmm. any true security, or is it just basically security theater? Make makes it makes people feel better that it's encrypted, but it was actually no safer than it was to begin with. Um. I'm not sure I completely understand your question, but let me make sure I replay this. So what you're saying is, you know, when you look at, and I think you brought up a good point, which is you've got all these config files from OpenStack, like Nova Conf, right, which is storing um, the Nova passwords, and then um, the um, the only people that can have access to it is your root or your, you know, Nova admin, right? right? And typically, inside the for config file, you'd, um, when you take the the uh, dev stack version, the dev stack, you know, doesn't encrypt it. I mean, vendors like us, we go in and we harden that and we say, okay, you know, this is not a good security practice. So then what we do is we take those, uh, we, we, we make sure that those passwords, when they're stored inside the config files, are actually encrypted. And, and, and the, your, your question is, what is the purpose behind that, right? And then the, 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 and the reality is, you know, it's just being security best practices throughout, uh, you know, and, and also understanding what is the risk involved, right? So if some, someone gets access to it, it could probably be only a root that gets access to it, and what, what, is, what is it that they're going to steal away, right? So it comes back to, you know, security best practices and risk mitigation. 
I don't know if I answered your yeah. question, but we'll yeah, take so it are, offline. Are you, are, you finding, are you finding a way to prevent root from, uh, someone with root access from being able to? That is, <laughs> that's going to be really hard, right? Yeah, I, can't I mean, if somebody has so. root access, they have access to everything. Okay. You can't, it's, it's, you, so, you so can't it's prevent that. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you can't prevent that. Sure. Um, I have a different kind of question. Um, I, I'm, I'm new to uh, OpenStack. <coughs> so in your uh, presentation, um, I think there was one slide that uh, mentioned that, um, you know, given that you know what to do uh, for to, to, to be compliant, um, I think there is actually, it would be great if there is a, a framework or tools that uh, <coughs> uh, so uh, users can quickly verify that, you know, um, things are actually uh, configured correctly for OpenStack. Um, uh, it would be great to have a tool or framework to easily tell that you have actually configured the system correctly. Exactly. And, uh, uh, yeah. So that, you know, you can show auditors uh, things are actually, you know, compliant, your system. Right, right, and, right. and that you can uh, uh, frequently do that so that Correct. you know it's it, 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 it's always compliant or, or most time compliant. Correct. So I wonder whether um, you know I mean and this question is maybe for for the community as well. Uh, is there something uh, in OpenStack already that you mm -hmm. know can can do that or or is that something that that's desirable mm. and it's, it's not there mm. uh, and should it be kind of created as maybe a, a, a project or something? So mm. that you know, I know a lot of uh, proprietary uh, 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 products are out there, you know, to check for you know uh, compliance uh, of your uh, your entire stack. Uh, you know, are, are they uh, you know different layers are all compliant for uh, PCI, for example? Yeah. Uh, but for OpenStack, you have different nodes. You have no correct, uh, correct. Now, actually, you brought up an excellent point, which is really saying, you know, how do you have a baseline of configuration, and how do you kind of monitor for drifts? And then, so there are a couple of ways to address this. So one is, you know, you have file monitoring, uh, file integrity monitoring tools available. Um, so they do that sort of thing where they um, have a baseline config and then they check for drifts. For OpenStack in particular, um, there are, you know, a few startups that are actually uh, doing this type of thing. Um, I don't think there's any uh, open source community uh, initiative, as far as I know. Uh, but there are a few startups that I mentioned. So one is called Cloud Rakshak. It's uh, Cloud C L O E D. Rakshak is spelled R A X A K. Um, and then so those those guys are actually having um, what are known as the um, continuous compliance monitoring um, for OpenStack, and they can do that for AWS and Azure. Um, so and they can also do it for a VMware environment. So you can you can say that they do it for you know all, high, all types of clouds. So we will have actually a demo from them um, later today. Um, so what they can do is so basically the way that they do is they have this baseline of uh, compliance template or standard that they um, input into their system, and then it basically says, hey, you know, this is the template. These are the ten rules that you need to follow. And then it can actually look at end-to-end -end compliance. So it can go all the way from you know hardware root of trust, all the way up to your OpenStack services. So, but it's not. But obviously, you know, it's not. It's not open source. It's proprietary. But um, this is definitely one area that I think you know the community needs to uh, start thinking about and addressing it. I, I agree. I think it's a great question. Thank you. So, um, when is when and where is the demo? The, that panel session is actually going to be here. Um, it's at uh, 5.40. Um, I think it's in, I forget, it's probably room 14 or 15. So somewhere here, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, Do we have time for one last question? Yeah. So certification and compliance are starting to manifest in OpenStack in many different ways. If you mm -hmm. look at, you know, from the exams that are being put out for administrators to configuration, open stand configurations that should be considered uh, secure to you know talks like this and others. We're trying to put a holistic picture together. Uh, when I did, I did an informal survey of OpenStack uh, various vendors out there, asking them that you know, do you have an OpenStack solution that you can give me, and is HIPAA compliant from, and it's turnkey. Hmm. So the answer I was getting was that 
it's you know if you if I use this widget or that widget, you know, then you could do, but not not a whole solution. So, in your opinion, I guess, mm -hmm. long story short, in your opinion, where is OpenStack heading? Where is OpenStack currently in terms of security and compliance from PCI and DSS? Are we at beginners, intermediate, advanced uh, levels? Mm -hmm. And two, uh, what should the community do uh, as a whole to address this? Uh, is there a need to publish some kind of uh, OpenStack compliance guides so similar to OpenStack security guides? Uh, some set, some products or configurations have to be considered that way. So where should where the do you see? That is a great question. So from the um, from a PCI perspective, I certainly see OpenStack more in the intermediate. Uh, intermediate, it's definitely not a beginner. We have crossed that stage. It's the intermediate, and then we want to get to the advanced stage. I think there are definitely opportunities where the community can um, contribute. There's uh, certain areas that I think would be things like, you know, uh, file integrity monitoring. I think that gentleman brought a great example. I think we want to do documentation. Uh, we want to be able to publish this to our uh, community users and say, hey, how can you actually, you know, configure your um, uh, cloud, OpenStack cloud in a compliant manner? Uh, documentation, I would say, um, ex exploring areas such as file integrity monitoring, and also, um, Tightening each layer of your of your uh, um, you know all the layers of the stack, so you we have to look at you know even auditing. We have to take a look at auditing from you know host operating system to guest OS, um, to OpenStack services. We really have to look at you know centralized logging. How can we implement that? I would say three different areas. So one is obviously you know a documentation, file integrity monitoring, monitoring drif drifts, uh, continuous monitoring. And then the um, the other one would be um, auditing and logging would be in those areas. Thank you very much. But uh, you know we are a part of HP, and I work very closely with my security team. Who are, um, Rob Clark used to lead our security. Um, he was a P P P PTL, but uh, he's moved on to another vendor. So okay. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Everyone.